This and every edition of Bang the Book Radio is presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. You sign up over at DSI using the promo code BTB and the number 25. You'll get a $25 free bet just to test out the site, check out the live betting interface, take a look around, see if it's a good fit for you. If you decide that it is a good fit for you with that BTB25 promo code, you'll also get a 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook and a 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino as well if you opt to add some funds there. At BetDSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two guests coming your way here today. The first, Mr. Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. Brian, how's it going today, man? It's going great, Adam. Great to hear your voice. All right, well, we've got a lot of considerations here for week 12 of the college football season, and this isn't the strongest set of games of the SEC, predominantly on a bye week here with them taking a lot of FCS or lower tier teams in FBS. We do have a couple of games. Kentucky and Georgia kind of stands out a little bit. Texas A&M and Ole Miss, of course, but overall, pretty weak uh, slate here for the SEC, but that doesn't mean that we lack games that have intrigue, and you know, Brian, we talked about this last week. We talked about the dwindling importance of power ratings. We talked about how some of those other angles come into play a little bit more here. Bowl uh, eligibility, bowl motivation, coaching considerations. We're going to talk about some of those games here today, but the one thing I think I noticed this week, Brian, is that Last week when we talked about teams that need a win or need to win two of their last three games to get to a bowl, we didn't see any inflation in the lines. This week, I think we do see it. Yeah, we do. And um, we talked last week about teams that needed the games a little bit more than others. Uh, The Auburn-Georgia was one of those prime examples that Georgia could take a loss. Uh, I unfortunately think the uh, committee overlooked that part of uh, handicapping that because they dropped from first to seventh, I believe. Uh, we said the same thing with the Ohio and Toledo game, that the game didn't mean anything to Toledo where it did to Ohio. And then we saw Ohio come out and, uh, you know, beat the hell out of Toledo. And then, of course, they going to Akron, who had no business beating um, Ohio yesterday. Um, but you found the opposite. You had a team in Akron that needed that game. And so you got a lot of better better effort out of that. So um, when you see these games near the end of the season, not only uh, are these teams playing for something, but sometimes they are not. And knowing when a team has not got anything to play for is even more important than the teams that do. And as I said, I don't make any adjustments about teams playing harder to get to a a bowl game than I do at any time during the season because that's what they're trying to do. But at this time of the season, when they get knocked out of the bowl, that's when you've got your chance to make some money. Yeah, and, and it's really hard because these are all things you have to pay attention to. And, and the college football playoff rankings, I mean, they have the top four teams right as of right now. And obviously we'll see what happens with Clemson and Miami, who should play each other down the line here in the ACC title game. But, man, wouldn't it be nice just one of these years to let the people out there in Vegas, the people that set lines, the people that bet lines, have some kind of say in who should be in the college football playoff because these rankings every year, I mean, I I can find a bone to pick with them all the time. And and that's not necessarily that big of a surprise. It's it's very rare to get the actual top four teams from a consensus power rating standpoint in the college football playoff. Yeah. You take a look at Wisconsin and the reason Wisconsin is so good this year is because they've had the easiest schedule in college football or one of the easiest. Uh, we'll find out, you know, they play Michigan this week, I believe, and then they'll play all, probably Ohio State in the championship. But, you know, Michigan's not that great, even though they so I think they are ranked out of the top 25. And, and Ohio State has got plenty of flaws. So, you know, if Wisconsin happens to win these two games, you'll know that they're going to be a huge underdog against anybody they play in the Final Four. And, you know, people who follow that will have an advantage being able to play that early because uh, – you know, the general public is going to look at that game and say, well, you know, they're a, they're a winless or a, they haven't lost a game all season. And who knows? They may go up against like an Auburn or a Georgia who have, who have two losses on the season. And uh, it'll be a great opportunity for the SEC to make some money there against a, an overrated Big Ten team. Yeah, that Wisconsin situation is interesting. I'll be curious to see how the committee handles Ohio State if they beat that team up north and then beat Wisconsin as well, which – is you know pretty much the way that it's shaping up and of course we're taking the illinois game for granted this week but ohio state's favored by more than 40 in that one uh but that that'll be the interesting thing because you have ammunition 
looking at Ohio State's college football playoff case to say, yeah, Wisconsin got to that game at 12-0, and but they didn't play anybody. So is that something that reflects negatively on the Buckeyes if we get to that point? Who knows? But, of course, we still have to see if we get to that point. And, I mean, possibly Wisconsin could lose this week. So, you know, who, who really knows? But, uh, Brian, the last thing I want to ask you about here in a general sense of getting college football, and then we'll start breaking down some of these specific games here, is – we, we have this college football playoff talk. We have all the talk about coaches and who's going where and who's going to be fired and this and that. Do you look to play against some of those biases in the market? Yeah, normally I, what, what I try to do is I go in and I try to look at how, try to read how the players feel about these coaches. And, you know, obviously if you got a situation like in uh, Arkansas right now, when the, when the players are celebrating that uh, the coach is probably leaving, that's not a team that I'm looking to play on. There's other teams where you definitely, as a player, feel that uh, you deserve to uh, give the best effort you can for your coach because he, he may be a guy that you really like and he's going to lose his job because you haven't done your job. Uh, that's where you you would expect a good outcome from, from those teams coming down the down the wire and but uh, like something like an Arkansas situation uh, I want nothing to do with it because you know it's obviously the players have not been happy there the players are losing their uh, people are getting arrested and they're going out after the game drinking and driving and it's there's got to be some responsibility there so you got to do a little bit more of a deep dive to find out Uh, you can't just overall take a look at it and say you want to go on or against these teams just got to go in and read a little bit All right, well, let's look at some of these considerations here. We'll kind of put them in practice a little bit with the games that we're going to discuss for Week 12. We'll start here on Wednesday night where Game 305-306 features Toledo taking on Bowling Green. Seeing a little bit of Toledo money hit the board here today on game day with the highest limits that we've seen throughout the week. Bookmaker up to 18, DSI at 18 as well. Several other shops out there sitting at 17 and a half. Now, there are a couple of different ways you can look at this game. For one, you can look at it from the Bowling Green side and say, you know, this is a Bowling Green team that has not been good throughout the year. I know you figured we'd have some value on them from an against-the-spread standpoint. We have, but they haven't covered a whole lot of numbers this year for people. Toledo, on the other hand, now they've kind of put themselves into a bit of a tough spot with that loss to Ohio. They have the head-to-head tiebreaker over Northern Illinois. They need to win this game, need to beat Western Michigan to find themselves in the MAC championship game where it appears that they'll play Akron, which is definitely – a little bit of a boost for them to get the zips instead of the Bobcats again. But Toledo's coming off of that blowout loss last week, and that's not something that we see from the Toledo Rockets very often. They're usually very competitive. They're usually the ones dealing out the blowouts. So I think some people kind of looking at this as a little bit of a bounce-back spot for the Rockets tonight. It should be. My number is 19, so it's a slight edge to Toledo in this one, but uh, if you take a look at the first half stats from last week, uh, yards per play were exactly the same, 6.3, 6.3. Um, and they were down 10 to 7 at the half. So it was right there for them. And then Ohio just came out in the second half and was able to do whatever they wanted. And when you have a team like Toledo, they rarely, you know, the same thing happened in the Miami game when they played at Miami. Uh, they were winning that game at the half, and then Miami just came out in the second half and blew them out. I don't consider Ohio nearly anything like Miami is, but uh, it's a team that uh, that doesn't uh, see themselves in that position very often. Uh, unfortunately, when they did play that Miami game, they did have a, a bye week the following week, and then uh, they did play Eastern Michigan, and they win that game 20-15, to 15, so I don't know if we can can learn anything from that, but, uh, you know, as I said last week, it didn't mean as much to Toledo, so maybe they uh, weren't playing full out uh, Bowling Green, um, as I mentioned earlier, was a team we could make money on, as you pointed out. They've covered three out of the last five. They are coming off of a bye, which always helps, and that's their only bye of the season. So, uh, you know, Bowling Green last week, I had them against Buffalo, and uh, and they lose that game by 10. But I, I think this line's about what it, where it should be at this point. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if Toledo wins by double digits but doesn't cover, but uh, it's not going to be a game I'm going to be involved in. Yeah, I think what's interesting about Toledo, and and maybe this had a little bit to do with what happened to them in the second half last week against Ohio, is that they expected to play Ohio again. I mean, you would not expect Ohio to lose as a two-touchdown favorite in Akron, and then Ohio should have finished out the regular season, putting themselves in a position to play Toledo again. 
And I saw some talk during the Oklahoma TCU game about, you know, what was going on with some of the play calling for the Sooners. And one of the speculations on Twitter was that Oklahoma was kind of holding parts of the playbook back in the second half, try and give TCU some different things to look at for film study, because the expectation was that Oklahoma would face TCU again in the Big 12 title game. So I wonder if maybe that was a thing for Toledo as well, which is sort of what you talked about last week in terms of it was a game that didn't mean as much to them as it meant to Ohio. Uh, So maybe Toledo was holding back a little bit. They're not going to hold back here against a rival who they can kick while they're down a little bit. Yeah, that was a big thing. And if you watch the play calling in the first half, it was pretty conservative from the Toledo standpoint. Um, A lot more running than what I thought they would do. Their passes were basically just right up the middle. Uh, Nothing downfield. Um, so uh, it, they were pretty vanilla last week, and, and as you pointed out, they were expecting to play Ohio again, and uh, it backfired on them. Um, of course, if they went out, it doesn't really matter, but still, it's it's you'll find teams in that regard, um, you know, with the, with the whole George, Georgia game last week, uh, you know, they knew they didn't need to win, and all they had to do was beat Alabama or beat Auburn again, and if they figured if they played Auburn again, then uh, they would have that advantage. Because if you watch that game, it was clear that uh, Georgia didn't bring the same intensity as Auburn did. Um, so, you know, we may be able to take advantage of that. If, if Auburn beats Alabama, um, you know, who knows? We may be able to uh, get that Georgia-Auburn rematch. And a lot of people just take a look at what they saw recently with Auburn crushing them. We may get a pretty good line on Georgia if that happens. One more game in the MAC that I want to touch on tonight. There are actually three Maction games on Wednesday night, but we're not going to talk about Western Michigan and Northern Illinois today because I want to touch on Eastern Michigan and Miami of Ohio. And this one's interesting because we're seeing some Eastern Michigan money hit the board here right now, and I'm checking to see if maybe Gus Ragland's not going to play or something like that. But I'm surprised to see some Eastern Michigan money hit the board here because this is a team that went to a bowl game last year, first time they've done so since 1987, They got to go to the Bahamas as well, which is something that obviously was great for those kids. But this year, they're not going bowling. They're three and seven. Best they can do is five wins, so they don't really have too much to play for the rest of the way. Miami of Ohio, on the other hand, if they beat Eastern Michigan this week and beat Ball State, which pretty much everybody has done, they'll get to a they'll get to six wins and should be selected for a bowl game. Last year, Miami started zero and six, went six and zero the rest of the way, got to a bowl game. So. They're used to this situation of playing with no margin for error. Brian, how do you explain the line move with Miami of Ohio down to a two-and-a-half-point favorite at Bookmaker and DSI now? Yeah, this is uh, been interesting line move. I'm, what I'm guessing is there's two different groups looking to play each side because when this line opened, um, it was at two-and-a-half, and it quickly went to three, uh, quickly went to three minus, I believe, 140 in some places. Uh, so there was money in looking to play Miami as soon as it came out. And then a couple of days later, it bounces back to three everywhere. And, and I get a little bit more on, on Eastern. Um, I, I'm with you. I, Eastern's a team that not only have they not been winning, um, their losses have all been close. Other than the last week, then when they did lose by 12 to Central Michigan, before that, their biggest loss was by five points. They've had three games going to overtime. This is a team in Miami, or excuse me, in Eastern, that could have easily um, gone bowling this year. They were, their power ratings are a lot stronger than what their record would would say. Um, when you're looking for next year's wins, we might be able to get some advantage on that. Um, people looking at Eastern Michigan coming off a poor season, but they've been a lot better in what their record states. But now they continue to fight, and we talked about this last week, and uh, they're down by 11 at the half last week. And then they lose by 12 overall to Central Michigan. That, to me, if I was on that team, I would really have a hard time getting up for this game this week against Miami. Uh, They go on the road for the third time in four weeks. Um, They play Bowling Green at home next week on a Tuesday, so that gives them a shorter week to prepare for uh, Bowling Green. I would think that would take precedence in front of the home fans. And you mentioned Miami. They they were off a bye week after – a short week after beating Akron, uh, 24 to 14 in that game. And you could tell by the way Miami played in the second half of the game. I had them, I I released them as a second half play and uh, they had a bigger lead against Akron. They let Akron come right back in it. 
But uh, they were excited, and, you know, they've been through it before. As you pointed out last year, they won their final games uh, to get on that run and go to a bowl game. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised by the line move here. Uh, it's definitely somebody else thinking differently than what we are. Well, and I think maybe what we're seeing, you mentioned Eastern Michigan being power rated a little bit higher than their record would suggest. Maybe that's what this is. Maybe you've got some numbers guys here with the big limits that are kind of coming in on this game. feel like it should be more of a pick em type scenario. But when you put all these situational angles in play, and, and that's what we've done here uh, during this segment, you can't help but think Miami of Ohio or nothing. I mean, for Eastern Michigan – to be three and seven here, to be plus eleven in point differential in conference and be one and five, to be plus twenty six in point differential and be three and seven, that just tells you how their season has gone with all those close losses. And that wears you down. Not just physically are you worn down late in the year, but mentally you're worn down. And with last week being your last stand where you have to win out to go to a bowl, I just don't know how Eastern Michigan gets off the deck here. If they do Mad, mad props to Chris Creighton for getting this team ready. Yeah, not only you – know, I'm with you on the power ratings. I've got Eastern Michigan as a one-point favorite based on pure power ratings here. They had their bye week all the way back in week three. So they've been playing all this time without a bye week. And as I pointed out, Miami had that, uh, that game against Akron last Tuesday, so they've had a full week – or two weeks ago. So they've had a full week uh, of a bye right here, a fi- full week of practice. Uh, yeah, this is, this is definitely, if you're looking at your season-long power ratings, uh, you would want to play Eastern, but the situation uh, definitely favors Miami here. And, uh, you know, if in in my book, uh, my, Miami, it's it's worth the additional price you have to pay to be on Miami. I think, I think those numbers are well within range, uh, as long as you don't have to lay more than three here um, to be an excellent play. All right, let's go to Friday night. Let's talk about UNLV. They take on New Mexico. New Mexico, a two-and-a-half-point favorite in this game. This is game 319-320 on the board. We talked about UNLV a little bit on last week's show. (coughs) Excuse me. With that loss at home to BYU, they have no margin for error now. They need to win on the road in Albuquerque, win on the road in Reno to get to a bowl game here. It was a pretty devastating and deflating loss, I think, for UNLV last week. They have a chance to bounce back right away. But you've got a New Mexico team here. It's senior day in Albuquerque. They've got some players to honor. I don't know what the situation will be like with Bob Davey going forward after there was an investigation into mistreatment of players. How are you seeing this game, Brian? Yeah, this is a game, this is one of those games where there's so many question marks here to make a definitive statement. You look at New Mexico last week, just their first half numbers, they allowed 10.6 yards for play to Texas A&M. Texas A&M just crushed them. Uh, scoring 48 points in that first half. Uh, you go back the last five games for New Mexico in the first half, they score 7, 3, 0, 10, and 0. And UNLV is not scoring in the first half either, 7, 7, and 9 in the last three games. It's not like either of these teams are playing great defenses. Um, you know, Texas A&M's, that's one of the weaknesses of the defense. They can put points on the board, but they can't stop anybody. Uh, Utah State the week before has not stopped anybody all season long. So um, these are two offenses that are really struggling right now. We saw a late uh, movement against UNLV last week. Um, I'm looking to play against both these teams, to be totally honest with you. So I'll be passing on this one. Yeah, and, and I don't blame you for that sentiment. I mean, this is a New Mexico team that won, what, nine games last year, I think. Wound up going to a bowl there with that Bob Davey option offense. And then this year – just hasn't really worked out for them. And and to be honest, they haven't really played too many close games either. They lost by two to New Mexico state in the rivalry game in week two, lost by three to Colorado state. Most of their other losses games where they just weren't very competitive. So, you know, part of that has to do with the fact that once New Mexico gets down because they can't throw a forward pass very well, it's hard for them to play catch up, but let's look at this from a UNLV standpoint here. I mean, this is a team that, Could very well go four and eight, could go six and six, could split these last couple of games. But as far as the direction of the program goes, Tony Sanchez seems to have this thing going in the right direction. They seem to be uh, certainly better than they were a few years ago. So do you feel like UNLV is maybe a little bit more trustworthy here in a spot like this than they would have been in years past? Maybe in years past, but I don't know if I agree with you with the uh, UNLV going in in a positive direction. Um, first of all, he's a high school coach and never coached uh, 
college ball in his life as a coordinator or as a, even as an assistant. So it was a risk for UNLV to do it. Uh, the reason why he was hired was our Fertitta brothers, who owned the you know the uh, wrestling, the UFC or whatever. Um, they they also were big um, sponsors in town. They over at um, Bishop Gorman, which is uh, like one of the best college football teams, or excuse me, best high school football teams year in and year out. They're having a down year this year, but um, they they put a lot of money into it and they said we will we will do this we'll put more money into the into the uh project over there at UNLV but we want this coach well it's it's nice thought and he was very good in high school his brother actually coaches the Bishop Gorman team now and his brother's had the same kind of success that he has had so I don't know if this point if it was the right call at all to make him the coach, and I don't fault him at all. It's just that when you haven't been there before, you, you it's a learning it's a learning experience from day one. Whereas other other teams have had guys that have coached in college football, regardless if it was a head coach or a or assistant coach or one of the other coaches on the team, they've been there. They've known they've done that. And for UNLV, they continue to to me they continue to make the same mistakes when they are favored in a game. They've thrown up clunkers all season long. Uh, they will surprise some people. You know, they've done that a couple times this year. Uh, beating Fresno was a nice surprise for them, and then people thought, okay, well, maybe this is it. And then the next game they fall on their face, face again. So there's no consistency out of UNLV. Um, and so it's tough to back them as a favorite. Yeah, no, I, I don't blame you for that. You certainly have a better pulse on that team than I do. So I appreciate your insights there with that one. One more college football game I want to touch on here, and, and this one we kind of talked about a little bit uh, in passing at the top of the segment. This game, 379-380, noon Eastern time kickoff between Mississippi State and Arkansas. You get games like this late in the season. I think this is a really good one to key in on here for our listeners this week. I think it's hard to make a play in this game, but we'll see if you have any stronger opinions. Athletic Director Jeff Long at Arkansas is out which means that Brett Bielema is also out. Now, at Mississippi State, Dan Mullen's been talked about for maybe the Florida job, maybe some other jobs as well. But Mississippi State, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Mississippi State off that close loss to Alabama last week, can they get off the deck? Can they go and beat up on a team that they should? Well, they lost to Arkansas last year, 58-42, uh, to 42, so there is some slight revenge there, but – Keep in mind, they've got uh, the big rival, Mississippi, on deck, and it's a Thursday game next week. So you play Alabama in a game that you were really right in there until a couple of, at least in my opinion, bad mistakes by the offense trying to kick field. You're not going to beat Alabama with field goals. You've got to put the pressure on Alabama. Uh, he's going for field goals when he should have been going for first downs, in my opinion. And I think that took some air out of Mississippi, uh, Mississippi State. They played Alabama – um, really festive atmosphere. Now they play Arkansas and they got Mississippi on Thursday. So you definitely could see a letdown from Mississippi State here. But you've got an Arkansas team who just has not played well. They did win two out of the last three. They beat Mississippi, Coastal Carolina on that last uh, ditch effort. But those are just one point victories against teams that, uh, you know, Coastal Carolina, they were 24 and a half point favorites. So then they play, you know, LSU last week and um, LSU beats them 30 to 10. Uh, right in that price range for what was expected. So I I don't want to put my money on Arkansas here, and the spot is so bad for Mississippi State, I can't trust them here. So I pass on this one and look for better games on the board. Yeah, I can't blame you for that, and uh, my apologies to the listeners there. I got some kind of uh, tickle in my throat here during the show. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, again, this is a situation that you run into here late in the year when you've got these coaching decisions that are coming out, and, you know, I think it's an interesting spot at Arkansas because uh, reportedly from what I'm seeing on Twitter, and these are unsubstantiated rumors as of now, but someone's kind of passing these along that when the announcement about athletic director, Jeff Long came out, the players were applauding the decision. They seem to be pretty happy with it, which would imply that they're happy to see Brett Bielema go. And if you've got a team like that, that doesn't want to play for a coach, then why would you back them? Even with the spot that Mississippi state is in, 
even with the beating that Nick Fitzgerald took last week in that game against Alabama, he got rocked a few times. There were times where he looked wobbly, didn't look like he was going to be able to continue that game, still went out there, nearly led that big upset. I, I think it's kind of a fascinating game here for a lot of reasons. And, and obviously the easy thing to do is to pass, and, and we touched on that already. But you, know, you will find situations like this here over the last two or three weeks of the regular season going forward to where you'll have this decision to make. And sometimes it's going to be a little bit more clear cut. These are the type of games where I like to look at either second half betting or in-game betting to see how the players come out, what kind of intensity they have. Um, it, it's, it's something that I have learned over the years is you can handicap a game as well as you possibly can going into the game, expecting a certain amount of effort coming out of the player, a certain amount of excitement. And then once you get to the game, it's just not there. I don't, regardless of if it was a bad week of practice or if the team is overlooking the game or something happened in the locker room where you just don't see the effort that you would expect out of these teams. And you see it more in college than you do in the pro because in the pros you're playing for a contract. In college, if you're a senior right now and you're not going bowling, what kind of effort are you going to put in uh, these last few games? So um, I would rather watch the beginning of the game and see what happens if I have, if I have to get involved in the game. I'll be looking to play something once the game starts. And that was a betting angle I talked about yesterday where you're going to have these teams that aren't going to a bowl game, these teams that don't have anything to play for, and you play that guessing game before the game actually starts of, you know, what kind of effort am I going to get from this team? I don't think it's going to be good. I'm going to fade them. I think they're going to show up. I'm going to back them. Once you get a series or two into the game, you can start to see something like that. And I thought that we had a spot like that uh, with Kent State the other night against Central Michigan to where, you know, obviously Kent State didn't cover the number, but it was a 7-3 to three game after one quarter. The only touchdown they gave up was a kick return touchdown. You thought to yourself, okay, maybe Kent State you know, is going to give a good effort here. Maybe I'll make a live play on them. If you would have made a live play, it obviously would have backfired. But the point remains that, you know, that I think that's a really good strategy to take here, Brian. And I think that, honestly, not to go down a rabbit hole, not to go off on a tangent, we can probably do that once college football is over. Live betting is the future of the industry because these full game numbers are just, they're getting so much tighter. There, there's so many more things you have to try to figure out injury situations, motivations, all that. Once you can actually see it play out on the field and you could take that uncertainty away. I, I really truly believe that live in game wagering is the future of this industry. I, I definitely agree. And I'm going to switch sports with you here and talk about the Cavaliers against the Knicks the other day. Uh, that was a game, obviously, with the comments that LeBron made. He didn't. He made them towards the ownership and and the general manager as opposed to the players. But the Knicks took it as if it was a dig on one of their players, and the Knicks came out fired up. I had the Knicks as a play in that game, but once they get into, got into LeBron's face and started yelling at LeBron right there, um, up until that point, the Cavs bench was lethargic. Cleveland was playing lethargic. That woke up the Cavaliers, and by the end of the game, the Cavs were the team with all the energy, and, of course, Cleveland comes back and wins. They don't cover, luckily, for myself. But uh, that is something that as soon as that happened, you realize Cleveland was about to make a run. And if you are playing live betting, that was just an opportune time to get in on it. Uh, your your computer situations and everything that they put into the live, live gambling for the Lions is not going to take that into effect. So that's something that you could really take advantage of in live betting, which you can't do in uh, pregame betting because you don't really know what the teams are going to come out with. You expect New York to come out with a good effort after what has happened, and they did. They played a great first half, but as the game went on and when they got into LeBron's face, you know, it's you, you don't uh, you don't uh, swat away Superman or whatever that was in that uh, Jim Croce song. You don't, you don't spit on his cape or whatever it was, but uh, that's the way it is, and uh, it's a great opportunity to make uh, live betting profits. All right, let's flip over to the NFL here for a few minutes, and, and let's touch on the first game on the board on Sunday, game 451-452. The Detroit Lions take on the Chicago Bears. Uh, the Bears failing to cover last week is a pretty sizable favorite against Green Bay. Mitch Trubisky almost threw for 300 yards in that game, and they still didn't come close to covering the number. Detroit played our hapless and beloved Cleveland Browns, who had one of the sickest beats both for the first half and the full game that I've seen in the NFL this year. I don't know what the hell happened at the end of the first half, but it cost the plus six and a half backers. 
full game. They were getting anywhere from 10 to 12, depending on when you got it. They lose by 14 because they throw a first and goal interception at the five. Uh, but not the most impressive performance for Detroit last week. Are you willing to lay three with them on the road this week? I was. I had that Cleveland in the first half and the full game in last week's action. I gave out the full game to my clients, and I tweeted out, that was the most Cleveland Browns game in a Cleveland Browns season, in a Cleveland Browns decade, basically, of Cleveland Browns football. It was just anything that you could do to lose a game, they were trying to do that, and it, it was so ugly. It was ridiculous, and it got to the point where it was laughable at the end. Um, and Detroit took advantage of it, and that's what you do against these bad football teams that don't know how to win. Uh, you're able to make make that, and, it, and considering all the money all week long came in on the Browns, it went from like 12 down to 10, and then Cleveland takes a 10 to nothing lead. And on any other team, you would ask me if I thought that was going to be a winner, I'd say yes. With the Browns up 10, all the money coming in, all the wise guy money coming in on that side, I still didn't think it was going to be a winner. And it was just one of those things as the game went on, you knew they were going to find a way to lose. So I, I, that was a, definitely a Cleveland game. So Detroit didn't do a whole lot in that game to me. Um, didn't do a whole lot. You know, they went at 38-24, to 24, final, the final line of 11. But uh, Detroit's been very fortunate in a lot of these games, if you ask me. I, I don't see them more than like a 500 ball club, 8-8 eight and eight team. They are a little bit better than Chicago here, but uh, – Chicago to lose to Green Bay like that coming off of a bye. Uh, Green Bay's offense had done nothing uh, after uh, the quarterback went out a few games ago to give up 33 points to a Green Bay team who's really struggled offensively. Um, when Chicago's playing a team that the defense could stop them and keep the offense from having to win the game, that's, that's what the Bears have to do. The two games before that, they give up 20 to New Orleans and three to Carolina. The defense has played very well, and the teams was in that, were in that. They beat Carolina 17-3, and they lose uh, to New Orleans by only eight. But once they get behind in the game and Chicago has to pass the ball with the rookie quarterback, it's when they get in trouble. Uh, Detroit does have a pretty good offense. The quarterback is, is having a, a really strong year. They've scored 38-30 and 30 the last two weeks. Detroit gets ahead here. That's the thing that I would be concerned about from Chicago. I I don't want Chicago in a situation where they've got to come back in this game, and I won't be having anything on on this before the game starts. But if you see Detroit getting out to a sizable lead here and Chicago has to pass the ball, um, I don't think they can do it, and you may be able to play some in-game on that. Yeah, it's interesting to see what's going on with this line where bookmaker Detroit opened minus 3, minus 15. Now the line is minus 3, minus 01. So it looks like right now, a little bit of the sharp involvement on Chicago for this game, but this number pretty much dug in at three across the market. So I think that kind of tells you, uh, you know, what the odds makers anticipate going forward with this game. And, you know, maybe we do see some, some sharp investment on both sides. I don't know, but I, it, it, you know what, overall, this is one of those NFL weeks where it's just, it's, it's not a great card of games. You've got a lot of ugly quarterbacks starting in these games. And of course you've got, you know, this Stafford Trubisky matchup here, which would appear to, f- to favor, Matt Stafford quite a bit, but Detroit, not a whole lot in the yards per play game this year. So we'll have to see what happens with the line move for that one. Brian, one other game I want to touch on with you here quickly. This is game 453, 454. We'll slide down the board just one spot. Kansas City takes on the New York Giants. And what's interesting about this game to me is that, you know, we saw earlier on in the season, the teams coming off the bye got steamed every single week. Well, You've got a Kansas City team here coming off the bye. Looks like this number opened a little bit high because people are backing the Giants right now. This number's down to 10 flat at some shops. Yeah, the line may be a little bit high, but you've got to keep in mind that road favorites coming off the bye do very well. Uh, last week, they cashed two out of three. Um, but, yeah, the line is t- high. In fact, Pittsburgh had the high line last week at 10. Went off a little bit higher than that, I believe, and that was the one loser a double-digit road favorite, which is what we find Kansas City in here. Uh, Kansas City off the bye. You've got one of the best coaches in in the NFL um, backing them up after that bye. So you would think Kansas City would have a good game, especially after losing to Dallas by double digits going into the bye. Um, But it is a non-conference game, and usually when you take a look at teams 
the least important game is your non-conference games, and this is their only non-conference game left as the season progresses. we got Buffalo, the Jets, Oakland, and the Chargers the next four weeks. Um, the Giants, a lot of people think they give up last week. I, I'm one of them. I, the coaching staff of the Giants has not done a very good job. I know they've had some injuries, and, and I, I made a comment early on in the season that I didn't think the Giants were going to make the playoffs and, and took some uh, – some, uh, crap on the internet for it but you know it's worked out in my favor I'm not happy for it if if you're a Giants fan I could care less if you know if they win or lose I just uh just didn't think that they were a very good team coming into the season uh not a big Eli Manning fan um the, after the way they played against San Francisco you would think they would come out and play well because anytime they question your manhood that you would quit you would come out and play but it's not the first time this season they have talked about the New York Giants in that way. And they do have a rival, Washington Redskins, coming up on Thursday. So it is a short week. Um, I prefer the Kansas City side. I just don't know if I can get there laying double digits. Um, maybe this is another one where we see how the Giants come out to play this game. And if they come out with the same energy they did last week against San Francisco, uh, that's not a team I want coming from behind. And, and Kansas City has the running game and has the ability to just – not turn the ball over, and you can't get back in that game against Kansas City unless you do something on your own. So um, see how that game starts out, and if the Giants don't play well, uh, go against the Giants the remainder of the game. Well, Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. What's going on over at the website right now, Brian? Uh, I put up a play in the uh, action for tonight, and I'm working on the rest of my uh, football plays for the weekend. I've gotten off to a nice hockey start. Basketball, as I said, I had the next Saturday. day. Uh, I don't put out a lot of plays, so if you're looking for a lot of plays, you look for somebody else. But I do try to find the best bargains on the board, and there'll be days I pass on certain sports, but I have pretty much at this time of year a play up every day. So we're giving you the best of the best here going into uh, the holiday season. Well, you can follow Brian on Twitter at B. Leonard Sports. Brian Leonard, wagertalk.com. Good to chat with you again this week, man, and we'll talk to you again next week. Great. Best of luck to everyone.